All right, I'm uh, going to call the uh, May 17th Finance Committee meeting to order. Doesn't look like we have any public comment. Yeah. First thing is the meeting minutes. Does anybody have any corrections, additions, deletions from the minutes? Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, Banking and related financial services. Sounds very exciting. <laughs> I'm so glad you agree with that. <laughs> it is exciting. Absolutely. The action item before you today is for banking services, which includes such things as our general banking accounts for payroll and accounts payable, uh, depository services for all the money that we collect off the fare boxes, our ACH wires, uh, account reconciliations, etc. Um, right now, the contract we have with SunTrust is coming to an end, so we went out with an RFP. And we had four respondents. We had four community banks, Chase Bank, SunTrust, and Bank United. We narrowed it down to two banks that we had come in for presentations, and that was Bank United and SunTrust. Bank United came in with the most cost competitive, the lowest cost on all their fees, and the highest guaranteed compensating balance um, interest rate. Matter of fact, it was three times what SunTrust had proposed. So staff, based on the low cost and on the high floor for the interest rate, we are recommending Bank United. The anticipated gross cost for this will be about 150000 over the five-year period. And with what we anticipate to get in on compensating balance interest income, it should net out to be $3,600 a year of expense. So not bad. <laughs> not bad. Uh, anyone have any questions? Um, Red, yes. The, the only question I have, and it's, uh, um, and it's more, mostly because I'm new here, um, how are the weightings for the evaluation criteria selected in the RFP? Um, we take a look at a couple things. Their organizational qualifications, that was 15%. Uh, the conversion and implementation plan, 5%. Customer service and quality, 20%. Um, account services, 20%. And banking fees, 20 or 40%. The fees are, you know, everybody who responded were, um, they were required to be QPDs, qualified depositories in the state of Florida. Uh, taking a look at how they transition to us. It's usually not that difficult. It's a little time consuming getting everybody's new signatures, et cetera. Uh, so we really looked at cost was the most important and in interest rate. So is that something that's set by your group? The, the, the weightings for each of yes. the categories as well as the categories themselves? Yes. Okay. Just and we usually have general categories that you'll see similar in every procurement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one yes. question. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Um, so this is for um, our operating accounts, not our investment. Accounts. Correct. The investments are bid out, um, and as a matter of fact, Bank United, for the most part, has been the highest interest rates on the as well. Really? They're, they're raising our money market account on 80 basis points to 100 basis points, too. But, Yes, sir. Go ahead. Any value for sure. to one group do both? Um, but when you, you know, the investment and the, or do they, do they, have, they have a way to cut down on some of our costs that we incur on the on the operating side and the by getting. Actually, we do. That's exactly you're you're right on point by having what we call compensating balances where we are an interest income. We keep a certain amount there to help compensate for it, but then we bid everything else out. <coughs> Get the highest interest rate, which is why Michael is better than one dollar. I think just eight. And what do we? What's our? So what is the cost? Forget the balance, the difference, right? The cumulative. You combine the two. What is the cost that we're incurring? So it would be about, about thirty thousand dollars a year. Okay. Um, okay. Before this offset. And what are we? Is that similar to what we have now? It is. Thank you. What, what is the balance required to uh, net out at $3,600? I think, I think it's about $2 or $3 million a month. Uh, How much? About $2 or $3 million a month. We'll have to keep it in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Michael's right on. 
But don't but it would but only have around fifteen or so million usually. We keep anything over that in the interest barrier. Because they're uh, Bank United's gonna pay a seventy five basis points on the compensated balance, but a hundred basis points I mean, not that compensated balance account. So we'll keep as much as possible with the interest barrier. Yeah. So so the idea is to keep enough money in there to net out very close to break even. Right. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Move approval. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you. That's that's very interesting to uh, learn about that. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure <coughs> if we in one sense needed to bring this to the board because of the compensating balances, but I thought it was important enough when you look at the gross costs, which is over a hundred thousand, and you'll learn anything over a hundred thousand needs to come to the board with the exception of what Diane and Randall will be talking about next. <laughs> She's our exception. But I think it's important because this is our main business relationship that you understand as a finance committee, as a board who we're dealing with. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let me get back to my Wait, if the committee's uh, okay with that, I would recommend this would go on Senate agenda for the Yeah, that's meeting. fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, Diane, you're going to talk to us about this settlement with this lady? Yes, sir. My name is Diane Randall. I'm the risk manager. Um, and normally board approval is required on expenditures over 100000 However, PSTA bylaws have set a threshold for claims settlements of 25000 So I'm here today on an action item to obtain settlement authority on an auto liability claim with Letisa Colston seeking 35000 approval. Um, in your packet, there's a full evaluation of the claim. So it's... Um, uh, this is the lowest cost, best resolution to the claim. So we're recommending that we go forward with the $35,000 settlement. Okay, any questions? Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. For consent. Okay, I think so, yeah. That's not that necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right along. Yeah. Be about along here. Okay, <coughs> small bus purchase. Henri. <laughs> Brings up the PowerPoint. Uh, I want to say welcome to Commissioner Shulman. My name is Henry Lucasset. I'm the Director of Maintenance. I oversee fleet and facilities. So today, uh, of course, I haven't presented in a couple of months, so I'm back this time and going to talk to you a little bit about smaller buses or what we call cutaways in the uh, industry. So. Okay, so let's define a couple terms. What exactly is a cutaway when we say that? And essentially, it is a vehicle that is built with a passenger body on it. So typically, you have chassis, which come from your major automotive manufacturers. They come in two different types. A strip chassis, which, as you can see, really has nothing on it. Or you can get an incomplete chassis um, and then after that, the magic happens. So those chassis go to what we call second stage manufacturers. This is where that becomes a transit vehicle. So what the second stage manufacturers do is they build a passenger frame. The seats go in it. Um, all of the typical transit amenities go in it to ultimately wind up what you have on the right, which is a complete vehicle. So it's a two-step process. They take chassis, it goes to companies such as Champion, Goshen, or Turtle Top, and then it becomes the bus as we see on the screen. So a little history, PSTA has been using cutaways. We had eight of them, and we utilize them on the North County service uh, 
since that service was uh, started in 2012. In April 2016, fleet maintenance decided that due to inherent problems with the mechanical um, reliability of the vehicles that were being run at the time, uh, because the reliability was so low to zero um, that we removed them from service permanently. Uh, what, what types of things were going wrong with that? Uh, there were problems with the air conditioning system, electrical system, suspension system. Uh, basically, there were numerous uh, mechanical problems, all interrelated so that um, basically at the time in 2016, it was, they were basically zero reliability. We wrote a very lengthy report to FTA to detail those problems. Is, is that just because we run them uh, a, lot of, a lot of miles and a lot of time? Right. I'll get into a little yeah. great question. So a couple things to point out about the vehicles that used to be run. They were E450s, um, considered a light chassis. Um, they were gas powered, and if you notice the 14,200 pound vehicle weight, that, that's just the capacity of the chassis. It really is considered a light to medium chassis. So to answer your question, it was just basically that the, the route that they were being used for was more, uh, it was more severe than what the vehicle was rated for. We just used it way too much for its design application. As you can see, that vehicle was uh, rated for five years or 150,000 miles. So even though those vehicles didn't necessarily work out, the typical smaller cutaways are perfect for the North County service because it just does not warrant using a full-size heavy-duty transit bus such as our Gillings in that, in that application. Uh, after review of the newest vehicles, and I'll get into uh, a little bit in the next slide about what was available to us, um, we have decided to look at a Freightliner chassis, and that is a heavier chassis. It's a 19,200 pound, which is considered medium heavy, and it's rated for 10 years for 350,000 miles. So it is the next level up from what we were running, but it's a step down from our heavy duty transit buses uh, that we do run. So the newer vehicles will be equipped with, and this is key, heavy duty, heavy duty rated engines and transmissions, um, the electrical system, plenty of electrical capacity for all of our technologies, HVAC systems, that's your heating, most importantly, that's your air conditioning systems, and our wheelchair lift, which will be a heavier duty at 1,000 pounds. Of course, the vehicles will also be equipped with all of our typical onboard technologies or passenger amenities that are the same on our uh, transit buses. So just like the state bus consortium where uh, groups <coughs> go out and, and conduct the procurement and we are able to purchase off it the state of Florida, specifically the FDOT and the partners of USF Cutter, um, have what is known as the TRIPS program. And what the TRIPS program does is basically it procures, it evaluates, it makes sure all the vehicles are vetted and approved for usage um, in various shapes, sizes, and types, <coughs> make sure everything is compliant with Federal Transit Administration clauses and basically make sure that these are the lowest prices that we can get these vehicles for. So they do all the work for us. We are allowed to purchase off these, these contracts which result. So the vehicle cost, as you can see laid out before you, is uh, the, the chosen uh, vendor would be Alliance Bus Group. And for the eight vehicles, it's about one point million. As you can see, with all the additional uh, required technologies and or amenities, uh, that adds a little bit more. So the total project cost is not to exceed 1.76 million. As, as we usually show, the breakout of our fiscal impact, you can see that we have FTA funding. Um, there's also the FDOT that is supplying a match and also 
a uh, small component of our match as well. So the recommendation is to approve the purchase of the eight replacement cutaway vehicles, not to exceed 1.3, and then also approve the purchase and installation of the additional technology at 460,000 for a total not to exceed 1.6 million. And I'd be happy to take and answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Henry. Um, so these are these are ten year, ten year three fifty. How long do you, when do you plan on replacing them? Again? Ten years, or as long as we can run them for. Hopefully, more than ten years. <laughs> you know, I know that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, realistically, it's not. I mean, they are what they are. I mean, well. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, that's what they're rated for. I, I can tell you that the maintenance department spent an awful lot of time just really fine-tuning from the top on down, from the roof to the tires, to build this as heavy-duty as possible. From the engine systems, which will be the Cummins 6 7, to the Allison's. Um, Is it be 300 or a It'll be the Allison 1000. 1000, right. Um, to, to the size of the tires, which will be heavier 19.5s, it's just the size of the tire right. to the, the subframe components to the air conditioning system heavy duty thermo king systems um, to the uh, air compressor systems with the heavy duty cummins um, to the alternator system so this how is how many btus on these uh it'll have the thermo it'll have dual thermo king m21 okay. roof mounted okay yeah, I mean, you expect it out of that as good as you can. Uh, and that's, and that's, that's a good price for the other two. That one fit that 159, that's a good price. The, the, the TRIPS program really does an excellent job negotiating uh, these contracts and getting these as low cost as possible. Right, yeah. Um, so these are low floor, I take it? They are not, they will be high floor for us. That also, uh, to answer your question, what went wrong, the low floor design on a cutaway is something that was also a design, also runnability issue that we were into. So what kind of what kind of lifts are you gonna have? It will have a side mounted rear lift. Uh, it will have the Braun uh, Millennium Series, which will be rated for 1,000 pounds. Okay. Um, perimeter, seating, forward facing? Forward facing, we were, we're also looking at changing the configuration a bit so that our folks in the, uh, mobility devices will be sitting forward of the rear axle so that there's a little bit better uh, of a cushioning of the ride for them as opposed to being All in the back. Right. Okay. Well, the forward facing seat, will they have seat belts on? Or? Yes. Thank you, sir. Well, that's why I always like listening to Brother Scott because he, <laughs> he knows he knows all the ins and outs yes, of these uh, of these buses. In addition to other things that he brings to the table, he knows knows these tr trucks in and out just like yourself. Um, so just 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 sort of kind of a comparative thing. Uh, it looks like they're about uh, let's say two hundred fifteen thousand a piece Correct. with everything on it. So it's a, so if if you have to replace these every Ten years. The question maybe it's nine or whatever it is, but ten years. Um, you're talking for each one about um, six hundred thousand dollars, assuming the price has stayed the same. Not that they're going to to replace it twice over the next thirty years. I'm trying to come up with some comparison to the bigger buses that are fifteen year life. You have to do it twice, so you're talking, you know, either depending on what kind of bus. And, the way we seem to be going towards the expensive kind, you're probably talking close to $2 million for um, a bus, a million times two, replacing it twice. So you're talking about $2 million versus $600,000. What's the gas um, that it uses and what's the gas mileage versus the big buses? So this vehicle uses diesel. It will be clean diesel. It will have all the uh, same uh, diesel emission compliant uh, equipment on it that buses on today. 
Uh, this particular vehicle does not come in a gasoline option, um, and that's just due to the design of the vehicle. The fuel economy that we can expect uh, ranges somewhere between 8 and possibly 12 miles per gallon. It will really depend on, on the application, the specific uh, routing, traffic flow, um, but that's what we're hoping for. Because it is a smaller vehicle than a heavy duty transit bus, there is some pickup on the fuel economy gate. And the current transit, they're, they're in the six range, right? Five and six. Is that what you did? The, 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 the diesel fleet right now? Yeah. The diesel fleet averages four, and the hybrid fleet is up around 5.2. Yeah, well, that, I think it just makes a lot of sense. I'll be curious to see how they, how they hold up from a maintenance standpoint. We will be but, uh, very much actively watching them the day they go into service. But you're talking three times the cost and the, or the, the more expensive units, you know, maybe two and a half times the cost in our hybrids. Uh, if you do it over a 30 year, but trying to, try to get to some comparative thing and then uh, from an operating cost standpoint, do you have any major capital replacements like you do in the big buses? Um, you know, you have, any, you have to do <coughs> major halfway through the, halfway oh, through oh, the cycle. Um, Overhauls, uh, you know, on these, they generally hold up pretty well, so not not the, not the breadth of what a transit bus would go through. You're gonna look at a lot of consumables to do such as brakes and possibly light like engine work. Um, but because these are more or less smaller components uh, compared to a transit bus, the cost is less. Um, What's the uh, number of people that these take versus the bigger buses? So these particular vehicles, can, and, I, and I, if I could point something out, there may be a, a terminology here that I didn't explain. So when you see 14 plus two passenger, okay, 14 means how many people can be seated in it, and two positions for folks in mobility devices that need to be secured. So right now, on the newer vehicle, we're looking at a 12 to 16 passenger plus two. So once we dial in the final configuration of the seating for the, our mobility passengers, that'll determine, but it won't be any less than 12. Typically, these vehicles can uh, be built for a capacity in excess of 25 passengers. Ours are ours because of the nature of the service is going to be about 12 to 16 passengers seated. What are our regular buses? Uh, right now, our 40 footers basically hold 38. There used to be a standard where each foot of the bus equaled the number of seats. Since that went to low floor, some seats have gone away, so lost about two, two, three seats when low floor came. But the, the, the number that you have on here would handle just about, well, I, I don't want to say what percentage of our routes, but a lot of our routes uh, that don't have the, the I wouldn't say that they would fit th this specific vehicle that we're building. I don't know if it would fit every single one of our routes in terms of the amount of passengers it carries, but I know for the North County service, um, the 12 to 16 range is, is adequate with a little bit of extra capacity built in. I can say that these vehicles are going to be built so that if needed, if ever needed, they could be inserted into a, another route, not to find to North County. We have needed to do that. Um, is there any other criteria other than like the, the, the number of people that normally ride that route? Is there another criteria that, that would not favor this one? I mean, other than we have 30 people on that bus route, so we can't use this because it's not big enough? Is there another? Is there the another? high floor is a problem. I mean, it's a problem? Yes. Oh. It, it, it takes substantially longer to activate the wheelchair lift, have the driver get up, go to the back. You know, operate the wheelchair lift, get the person in, security, etc. Then the low floor, you know, when back in 2011, um, when I had just started, when we bought the other ones, we <coughs> those were the first low floor the transit agency at the time really was valuable. But the low floor um, buses are substantially better for not just disabled folks, but all everybody. It's easier to get onto a bus when it's low <coughs> floor, but you know, all that great lift. So they tried that new 
a newfangled thing of a cutaway that's low floor, and it was a complete disaster. But it was an attempt, you know, because we have a lot of uh, older people that uh, ride the North County routes, and um, this that will be a challenge, mm. you know, with these. I think. Plus, as Henry said, you know, um, hopefully these vehicles will work. Um, the good thing about a Gilly is that it, it works and it is reliable. The, the, the eight cutaways we've already had before, they, they were not reliable. Uh, from home, almost opening day, they had problems. Uh, and, um, you know, if you've ever ridden in one, it's not nearly as nice uh, and it feels like it's well, those, those at least felt like they were going to uh, fall apart. It, we don't bring any, you know, small little bump. So again, I'm just trying to understand. Thank you for that, because that does kind of differentiate why we don't go to more of these than what we're doing. But um, I'm just wondering why there's why you're settling on North County for that reason versus just by the number of people that are that are you know on the routes typically. Is that really more the determiner? Or, I mean, you said you have a lot of older folks in the North County that are riding your buses. I think that's what you said. So why would we go to these that are less comfortable or could well, they're less e they're easy to navigate? I'm just trying to understand the criteria for which routes are going to get these buses. That's all. Well, again, just just like um, We're just trying to pile uh, all transportation. We, look, we the number one factor is we look at the maximum ridership okay. at any one time right. on any route. So there could be other routes that are eligible. There will be, you know, certainly. But I, you know, our our median uh, riders per hour is around 22, 23. Okay. Um, so for the app, the median route in our system, these are not Big, large enough. Uh, plus, there's really no safe way to have a standee on these <coughs> on these vehicles, and and the 38 passenger seated passenger Gillick can probably have 20, 25. Standees. Okay, right. thank you. Appreciate it. The big part of these buses is they deviate off route. They deviate up to a three quarters of a mile off route to pick people up um, on that surface down, you know, down roads that aren't necessarily, you know, the model for some of our heavier duty buses. So a lot of these cutaways for the connector service can go into residential neighborhoods, can go into shopping areas, wherever people call to kind of make the stop. So that's one of the main appeals for the cutaways on this particular service. And you have more of that in the North County, probably. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they'll operate another press at time too. Canals Park, maybe the, the 32 down in St. Pete. Um, will, will they be branded specifically for the connectors? Or, I think the ones we had, weren't they branded? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were. So would we brand these, not brand these specifically for them, just brand them to PSD? Well, that was my thought, but I haven't told anyone else at PSD that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All right. So so like see how they, if, if these actually are a workout and they are reliable, then I think we should look at more of them. I mean, we can get these on the state contract now that there is a state contract, and um, you know, maybe, maybe we can expand the number of these. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Shulman. Um, based on the routes that these are expected to run, what is the average mileage uh, for those routes in North County? Do we do we have that number? Really? In, in a year, how, how many miles were we running the old buses and that's on, on that route? Uh, how, how, many, how many miles per day? We can get that. We can get that information. I don't yeah. know what it is offhand, but I, I have that. Yeah. I can send that directly. They're a little bit shorter, but not that much shorter than our other miles. Um, yeah. I guess I'm trying to gauge also not just the year mileage, uh, the year rating, but also the mileage rating for, for the vehicle. Um, you know, if we're running, if we're running 50,000 miles a year, I don't know. And then obviously, thinking of a 10-year time frame is, is probably not the way to go. So that's why I was, I was leaning towards that information. Right. And, uh, I mean, the specific number I don't know off, off hand, but we know we had a lot of dead hit just because simply it was, you know, driving up to North County it before we went service. Right, and it also deviates off the route, so there's extra mileage, and I just don't know what those. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and I think that was one of the things with our original cutaways. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the just kind of the demand on um, you know how it went into service every day, but yeah, we we can that. Okay. All right. Um, <coughs> that chassis. Going back to the chassis thing. Um, okay. Now, what with the uh, one more? Yeah. 
Okay, that, that incomplete chassis on the right hand side, what other kinds of things would go on that chassis? Besides like a big box truck that might be late, but uh, would, would, could you put a uh, garbage truck on there, a cement mixer, uh, what kind of things? All, those those things. They, all of those things that you mentioned for the incomplete and typically on your strip chassis, they also make those replica trolleys. Uh -huh. so, so lots of usage for these particular chassis. Um, I can't say that when the chassis ultimately wind up being configured for transit, passenger comfort, there's more add-ons that are put on that to achieve comfort for the passenger as opposed to a garbage truck or a dump truck, which is completely utilitarian. Yeah, yeah. well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that those are built for much heavier duty than what we originally purchased. Yes, very much so. Okay. so. So these should hold up better is what I'm really asking. Yes, that okay. is. Uh, now the other question is, uh, most of this money comes from grants or matching grants or whatever. Um, <coughs> since the previous vehicles <coughs> did not <coughs> hold up, do they, um, do we have to pay some money back on them? I, I will answer that one. Yeah. Um, FTA. Because I'm, I'm worried about these, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, FTA, when you have a useful life that is left on the books for an asset that is being retired or taken out of service early, they ask that you set aside, in our case, you can either send them the money back or set aside the money in a restricted account that can be then used towards the next purchase of an FTA eligible item and or similar like item, so we'll be doing that with this. Mm -hmm. It was about $248,000 on the side. Okay. <clears throat> so again, what I'm asking here in a roundabout way is, and I think it's a question that other folks are asking, is instead of using this approach, which is primarily for like uh, those kind of buses, you see them uh, for retirement communities that take people to the orchestra and things like that. But we're using them on a daily basis and much heavier. We're running, what, 20, 30 miles just to get to where they're gonna start to pick up people. Um, is, it, is this gonna last this time or should we be going to, you know, a shorter version of a conventional bus or some other vehicle that would, that would be driving through? Well, I can say that we learned from the vehicles that we were running in that service. And we took all of those lessons learned and really, as I mentioned before, took a look at this chassis. And this is about as heavy duty as you can get for a vehicle that really suits the application that this will be running in. So to answer your question, I believe they're going to last. I mean, they, they have a lot of components that also are similar to uh, what's on our transit buses today. Um, like I mentioned, heavy duty air conditioning, engine and transmission systems, it's heavy duty uh, uh, suspension components. So um, we, we really look from the top on down and it really, this is about as heavy duty as you can get that matches the application. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Henry, just as a point of reference, so just the base bus here is 159,000. We were to look at a 30-foot gilling to run these. That's going to be what? Just the base bus, about 400? Yes. So just to give everybody a point, a point of reference, was a 30-foot gilling. And that was going to be my last point. Maybe when you bring this to the board, you could have some columns that reflect that. It shows what the gilding is. That, and I know that they're not apples and apples necessarily, just trying to get some perspective on the three different kinds of buses that we look at traditionally alongside of it. So we can, I mean, not that these can replace those because of what you said, that the median number, the median ridership is at 20 cents. So, but there's a lot that the median means the middle. So there's a lot that are underneath that that might qualify. It'd be, I, I think it'd be interesting as we consider this just to see what the others are, just to further hit home on that point. Because you do have some major uh, overhaul on those bigger buses, especially the hybrid, right? Halfway through, you have a 
fairly major, and probably not with these. You might have some, but nothing. So it'd be nice to just kind of see that side by side. It's an education piece. And this is going to get probably about 25% better than fuel economy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. That's okay. That was, uh, what did it do? 8 to 12. 8 to 12 versus 4 to 6. And that's, that's big. Here's your shoulder. Yeah, I realize this is a 2018 uh, um, chassis that we're looking at, but uh, other transit agencies used a similar configuration with the heavier duty uh, setup in the way that we're looking to use, and do we have a sense of what their maintenance experience has been? These, yes, um, their maintenance experience has been, uh, they purposely went to these vehicles because the lighter duty vehicles were just not holding up. Um, so. Uh, they're having better luck with them than say with your Ford chassis, your lighter duty chassis. Um, I can get some numbers and, and get some specifics out of them. I know that our colleagues in Jackson will use them, um, Gainesville as well. Um, so these these vehicles are actually in the configuration that we're proposing are actually new to the trips contract this year. So there was a, a lot of interest in, in getting these vehicles of, of this type um, because it was relatively the next step um, in terms of durability. And, and you have some experience in your career. <coughs> Prior to two transit properties ago, I worked at a transit authority that had 35 cutaways um, from many different manufacturers. So uh, the, these actually hold a special place in my heart because I it was just what the application was for I, I just want to make sure because what I hear and what I've had is some of the concern that the you know PSTA tried the lighter duty version and it didn't work and here we're going to something that's also it, it's a new chassis everyone it's new to the contract everyone's excited about it um, it's something to uh, calm those fears that it's you know, from a maintenance standpoint, out of the frying pan into fire uh, sort of setup. So, if you could bring that experience or uh, share some yeah. of that um, uh, maintenance reliability to, to the board presentation, I think it'd be helpful. I have a feeling we're going to get that's a good point because I have a feeling we're going to get some more questions next week. Um, you go one, anybody else? One, one, okay, one. Uh, oh, you got more? <laughs> okay. You have, a, have an estimate, Henry. What do you think the maintenance cost per mile is going to be on this? Uh, but I can certainly ask for should be less than what I had in transit process. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Can you move forward a couple of slides? Uh, keep going. I'm looking for the one where the uh, contract, uh, yeah, okay, back up. Yeah, okay. Because this has been um, recommended or evaluated through the TRIPS program, can we assume that somebody in, in the TRIPS program has done a lot of research that these will in fact hold up better than the one Yes, thank you. thank you. So TRIPS is basically a program by the FDOT. Mm -hmm. USF Cutter, which is the University of South, South Florida Center for Urban Transit Research. That is a secondary arm of the FDOT. And what their job is, is to do the research, look at vehicles, um, get reliability ratings, so on and so forth, so that the vehicles that are ultimately approved for the contract um, are vehicles that are rated for what they're intended to be used for. So they spend a lot of time doing it. In fact, um, we've waited actually about a year for new contracts to be issued to us because they just took a lot of time evaluating the proposed vehicles from the manufacturers. Okay, so you feel comfortable that uh, under this set of circumstances that these will in fact hold up and we won't right we I won't be so. buying another batch of you goes so. oh I not point out that we we bought the last eight from the uh, same trips yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, so in other words they're not necessarily yeah. doing any kind of uh, studies on on longevity or durability of this I mean, I mean they, they put together a good specification and a good procurement and they buy mm -hmm. but um we're the guys who came. One last comment. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, I'm excited about the, the possibility that these things will be, you know, a 
sound investment. Um, and I think the, the cost is just interesting. And back to your point uh, about that median number, the 22 riders from the medium route. Yeah. Did you have a breakdown of what that of those of those different levels like? Yeah. I would love to see that. So, how many of those routes would these kinds of buses ultimately be a candidate for? Not now, but as we want to see how these things hold up, but down the road, because I think it speaks to a lot of people's concerns about PSDA mm -hmm. riding around with a lot of empty buses. I mean, that 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 thought. So this kind of addresses some of those smaller ridden routes that we still have to have. Yeah. You know, I think it's good. I mentioned that lady that's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Here, here's the thing with this, Commissioner Eckers. We had a meeting, Brad and I had a meeting last night in one of my cities. And somebody caught up and started talking that empty buses stuff mm -hmm. all the time. And what people envision is they, they see some times where there are a few people on the bus, but they forget that during work hours, there's a lot of people on the bus. People think we're going to have two sets of buses, a big bus and a small bus, and in the middle of the day, we send our drivers back to the yard, switch vehicles, drive around in small vehicles, and then go back. It's not financially vi viable to do that. And that's that's not, you know, we, we can't... Uh, well, that's why I asked the question about that that mix where we have the smaller ridership, you know, routes. If, if, you know, I'd be just curious to see how many of those would even qualify for a bus like this. So. And there are busy times and, and not busy times, I understand. But it'd be nice to know. Yeah, I don't think the public knows that. But, uh, yeah. it, it's important to have, PSA has always been about a mix of uh, yeah. types of vehicles. This is a, an application. Hopefully we pick a winner here that we can expand this. I mean, I don't think it'll ever be 200 of these, but um, we'll certainly have at least eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I move approval. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Henry, thank you very much. Sorry to run you through the ringer on this. Yeah, this is important. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, on, on, right on the printed thing, we had the final evaluation score sheet. Uh, that's not on this, so do, do we skip that? Uh, well, again, this was this was purchased off a state contract. No, I'm, uh, no, back at three B. Um, I'm saying yeah. Oh, the so final was 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 score sheet we did. Yeah, that. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, we did. Okay, all right. So uh, let's move on to uh, financial uh, monthly financial statement. Thank you. Um, we're reviewing the month of March, and in the month of March, we had a an actual deficit of 1.9 million compared to a budgeted deficit of 1.8 million for 190,477 variants. It was unfavorable. Revenues were $239,000 under budget. Some of the key areas that were driving it to go under budget are timing of our property tax revenue and also state grant revenue. Those two items alone totaled about $234,000. We will catch up on that during the remainder of the year. Uh, fair revenues were down 7.4%. And then we also had offsets where we were above, favorable to budget on uh, various grant revenues and on um, well, um, trolley revenues and um, other grant revenues from the federal side. On the expense side for the <coughs> month, we were $49,000 under budget. That kind of helped to offset that. Although we were over budget on different areas such as service expenses, we had some uh, outside accident repairs. Those are difficult to predict. Our supplies expense, so overhaul budget, or buses were over budget, but we do anticipate that to be on target for the year. We had some good news on utilities under budget. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that in the public hearing, or on the uh, capital side, rather. We're putting new chillers in, so we'll, we may have had a few warm days in here where we weren't using as much electricity. Um, also included in there, just as a little aside, is we did an, um, an audit of all, all of our telephones and T1 lines, anything related to that part of the utility, and we have seen a huge amount of savings with renegotiated contracts on that. So that's embedded in here as well throughout the year. 
And other than that, we are, if we turn the page to take a look at uh, how we're doing on a year-to-date basis, that was just for the month. We have on a year-to-date basis a surplus of 19.7 million compared to a budget of 20.3 million for 590,000 unfavorable variants. Our revenues were $1.4 million under budget. The key driver on that is passenger fare revenue. Again, we've got some timing issues of about 455,000 that we'll catch up on during the course of the year. When we look at expenses on an overall basis, you can see we are under budget in every category with the exception of our purchase transportation, primarily TV expense. So we're assuming we get the grant revenue, which I am sure we will, because it's just a matter of timing. Without that, we would only be about one, less than 1% variance on a year-to-date basis. So it's something that we look at as we're looking forward. Uh, I think it's going to be a challenging year as we go forward to stay on budget, but I'm sure our team will pull together to be on target. Okay, questions? The next report that we have, this is our quarterly report time, is on capital. And I'm actually very pleased to say our capital budget, which usually you'll find wide swings when we track it, we've only been tracking this for maybe the last year or so, kind of see where we are at. We are amazingly on target with only a slight variance of about 2.9%. So that is good news, which means that our, our project managers are staying on top of their projects. And some key things to accomplishments that we've had since we last talked about this, you're sitting in one of them, so we're sitting up for comfort in these new chairs. That was a project where we have all new chairs in our conference rooms. So no longer do we reach over to put our arm and we go like this or switch around chairs. So we're very excited for those of us who get to sit in quite a bit. We've also been kicking off our AC chiller replacement. Uh, we're in the design phase of that. I think that's moving along because we have had issues where we've had uh, chillers have been down. It's either been extraordinarily cold or extraordinarily warm in here. Um, the regional fair collection, and that is where we have our flamingo fairs, and we'll have not only the ones on your phone, but the cars where you'll tap getting on the bus. During the month of March, we had a team from both Hart and PSTA go through what they call factory acceptance testing on that, which was extremely successful in moving forward. We are also moving forward on the buses, which will go into production for our hybrid BAEs. Yeah, BAEs. In June, they go into production, and our first bus will be arriving in August. Electric buses are also moving forward. The contract is at BYD, and hopefully back by the end of this week, Brad. But we'll get an exact date. Good. So there's quite a bit going on. We have a significant number of projects that are moving forward on all fronts. We is also have capital report in here. I didn't see it. Yeah. It's a. I'm sorry. It's a small quarterly report. Quarterly report. Oh, under quarterly. I'm sorry. I was still also, in there should be a link to a description of every project. It's quite lengthy if you want to read it for some fun evening reading. But what we do is we take a look at every project and we put in milestones. We put in if we're getting off course on a milestone, what the recovery schedule is how it's funded a brief description. So it gives us a whole history of every single project that we're working on. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Scott. Um, hey Debbie, just a quick question on, uh, over the last few weeks, diesel fuel took a pretty good dip. Mm -hmm. did, we, did we buy some? We did. All right. Good, uh, good, that leads us right into fuel. Yeah. Yes, it has is dipped, um, it. dipped quite a bit, and we are part of a consortium with Hart on that to buy fuel. Uh, they, they do their contracts year by year, and I had asked to do it over a five-year period so that we're in the budget process as we are right now. And I can see prices changing. I've been locking going forward. Right. Actually, as of yesterday, I locked in about 70% at $1.68. Yep. No, 70% of next year? Of next year's fuel, which is about 2.4 million gallons. Yep. So that it's, it's hard to imagine going much lower than that. Yeah. I mean, it, that was a nice, that was a nice dip. I don't know where that came from. I don't know either, but we put our trigger in. Yeah. What, just sort of, for those of you who don't know, 
when you lock in fuel and you're looking out in the NYMEX and you say, oh, it's at $1.54, you have to add a, a surcharge on top of that of almost 15 cents on top of that because, you know, the people who are doing this are taking a risk as well. But this way we're locking in a portion of our budget, we're hedging our risk on what we have to pay for about 70%. Um, the other piece is what we call unhedged, so it's floating to the marketplace. If we see, as the course of the year goes on, prices really accelerate, we always have the option of locking in more contracts. But if not, you have a portion that will float to the marketplace. This year when we did that, we did about 60, 65% locked in. We had the benefit of the other percentages being well below what we locked in at. So we had a favorable variance to budget. Good. I know I, 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 I <laughs> a few months ago and uh, and uh, had a nice dip and then it for delivery when it dipped again you know you can't be time this stuff you, you win you win you lose it's just it's just trying to lock in the budget so other questions um, I have a question um, I know it's early yet we're only a little over halfway done the year but do we uh, anticipate we're going to end up pretty close to what we budgeted? Or? Well, I can say from, um, I always have to confess things that I know about about my area. <laughs> but everyone's been, I think, very good about helping to contain the cost, which is going to be very important for it to probably even go forward. One thing that I know will have negatively impact on a non-cash basis this year is that when we went through the audit, <coughs> The auditors had pointed out that a, a revenue that we received in November from property tax, it specifically says it's for June through September, that for years we have historically put in the year early too. They said it is pursuant to the property tax website, we should be recording it in the year we receive it, not the year it relates to. So for this year, we'll have a one year dip in what we have to record in revenue of several hundred thousand, and then next year we'll be back on track to something that's more important. Other than that, you know, our concerns, our major challenges on the fair revenue side. I know in, this was March, April's numbers we already have, and we were about $183,000 under budget. May looks to be over budget, which is good news. Um, and that's primarily due to a huge order from AMSCOT. Both CVS and AMSCOT buy bulk purchases from us. <coughs> we never know when they're going to do it. So that could, that could go one way or the other at any time. It could. Mm -hmm. But I will say the staff has been phenomenal at trying to come in on or under budget. Okay. We're also in the middle of the budget process for next year. <coughs> and I will tell you, I am as proud as proud to be for everybody and what they're doing to save costs. Uh, have you done any uh, one back of an envelope kind of calculation of what would happen if, in fact, this uh, additional uh, reduction in property revenue, property tax revenues, comes in in 2018? Yes, um, we've done. We went straight when that first came out. We went straight to the property appraiser's office. They gave us an estimate that would have an impact of about 2.4 million. Then also from the property appraisal's office, we got an estimate of 1.9 million. That would negatively the county, impact. The county administrator sent a 1.9 million dollar number. So I don't know. Okay, so around 2 million, somewhere in the middle there, we could actually yeah. lose. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we don't have any way to make that up uh, to another venue. Well, we are going to have to meet the challenges on that. Yeah. You know, we continue to look at how we structure our routes, you know, going towards the grid system, which will help the efficiencies there. Uh, we have room, you can always move on capital items when you're actually purchasing them. So we might have some room on that as well to mitigate that. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, kind of scary uh, <coughs> in, the, in the cities too. So. And the county. And the county. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, it's very scary. <laughs> I was just curious, why did you get something, an estimate on this from this county? Did you ask the county? Or did, I mean, I know you asked the property no. appraiser. Um, I was wondering why you got a separate number from the county. Uh, Mark Woodard sent out an email, I think, to all the city managers and me, or all the different entities that was, he was forwarding 
an email that he had gotten from the property appraiser also that listed every um, every city and county and PSPA and every entity that receives the ad valorem a table that showed a $1.9 million impact. And then we had already previously reached out directly to the property appraiser and got an <coughs> We're trying to recognize that. Okay, you're still working on reconciling it. Okay, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a pretty big difference, though. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, any other questions? No. Just keep on top of that. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. scary. Okay. <coughs> Hello, uh, PSA, like all, all the cities and everything are, uh, well, at least I'm eagerly awaiting um, around June 1st is when they send out the updated property valuations um, for, the, for the next fiscal year. Um, right now, we're, we're assuming the county's assumption from January, which it sounds like it might be a little bit better. The counties was five or something. Yeah. It looks like it's going to be in the sixes somewhere. Yeah. And we always subtract 0.2% because of we're not actually the entire county. We're, we're the land of Stretch Island and Zinke Beach. Mm-hmm. Rich cities. Right. <laughs> Relatively so. yeah. high value cities. Yeah. All right. Ridership and uh, performance. Brad? Uh, that, that's a piece of paper at your places uh, for the month of April. And uh, I was thinking as I drove into work today, what about like the 10th day rate? Just below 500. Yeah. We're, we're, we're holding steady. Um, as you can see, total, total ridership uh, dropped by 4.7%, which, you know, with one fewer day, is really right around holding flat. Um, Problem for our budget is that dark ridership is up substantially, um, and that costs us more because every ride we, we pay per ride on dark uh, to our contractor to care ride, and they're doing such a great job and they're so customer friendly that more and more <laughs> residents are uh, using. They're talking it, it up, huh? Uh, yeah, and it's up. Uh, what is it? Five, five <coughs> Um So we'll, we'll keep track of it. I mean, uh, May, May is looking pretty pretty flat, or maybe a little, maybe a little better. We'll just have to see uh, on May. And hey, Brad. Yeah. The, the other bus passenger trips is up significantly with the county of uh, the, the Jolly Trolley, the, the fact that it was free um, to spring for spring oh. break um, to the beach. I think, I think that's the predominant uh, thing. Although they uh, also, in addition to the looper riders, it up a little bit. Um, yeah. Up from a, a, a relatively low number. Um, what dark TV trips were? Mm -hmm. Huge. Okay. Will that flatten out, or is that going to continue to increase? What? The trips from dark. Is that, is that kind of an expandable marketplace, really? If, if more people <coughs> like what we're doing. Yeah, I mean that, that's the issue with care ten. That that's one one of the reasons why we're we're excited about our uh, initiative, our what we call our sandbox grant um, program, which the planning committee is about to hear about. Um, by using TNCs like Lyft to to have dark customers ride Lyft, we think that I mean that will be slightly that will be lower cost per trip than Care Ride, um, and save us some money and try to meet meet demand and it'll be better service for the customers because they can get a ride in ten minutes uh, rather than uh, you know the day day ahead. Right. Yes, Just to like like point out the miles per road call and miles per service interruption is uh, extremely favorable this month, so good job, Henry. Mm -hmm. yep. It is. Okay, he's a wrong start. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Okay, any questions? Sir. All right. I'm going to say, is there anything else? Intermediate subjects, do we have anything special to talk about there? Uh, no. Um, so we, we have a uh, public hearing scheduled uh, for 10.30. Um, this is a, this is a public hearing for I'm just trying to think of this. This is a public hearing for our federal grants that we're required to have, um, and we were we scheduled it for 10:30. A quorum is not necessarily needed, but for the um, for the hearing, although it's just an opportunity if anyone comes to learn more. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, I think it's okay to adjourn the meeting if you'd like. And, all right, if there are no objections, do we have any other questions, comments? No. Okay, I'll turn the meeting. Who's supposed to be in the public meeting? What is that? All? I know. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry. What? Who's supposed to be in the what board? What group is meeting for the public hearing? Well, the planning committee, the planning committee starts at 10.30. Uh, they're supposed to start at 10.30, so we, we put the public hearing in between, thinking, I didn't realize this was going to be over by 10. So, you know, to allow board members that were here for either committee to attend the hearing. Um, but regardless, we're going to get whatever comment we receive at public hearing um, and bring it back, bring it to the board. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Any questions?